Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a new lecture within our Jean Monnet Open Online course of European Integration. As you know, this course is funded by the European Union through the Erasmus Plus program, and this is the European Union's uh, Education, Youth and Sports program. And it is very important that we say this, that we receive this funding through a Jean Monnet chair, in order to be thankful, to, to acknowledge the financial contribution, but also for the sake of transparency in order to avoid any conflict of interest. It's important to know, it helps very much to know who pays for, for each information that we receive. We will see in the future in this course that this year is dedicated to European integration as in the previous years, but it is more focused on strategic communications. We will understand in future lectures why it's so important to know who pays for the information you receive. Good. Today's lecture is a very important one because today we will discuss some um, EU policies um, that are uh, not as important as the single market, but are very important for the European Union to work as a whole. And the title of today's lecture that I have posted on YouTube and on Facebook is Greasing the Wheels. It's greasing the wheels of the EU. The policies that we will analyze today are the EU budget policies and EU social policy. So today we will see how the European Union spends money on policies such as agricultural policy or regional policy or social policy and how this is related to the single market. In the previous lectures, we said the single market is the most important policy of the EU. The single market that includes the freedom of movement of goods, services, capital and workers in Europe. This is something that increases efficiency in Europe. It allows a more efficient allocation of resources in Europe. It allows for workers to be able to work where they will receive a higher wage, where they will be more productive. It allows for capital to be invested in places where it will be more productive as well, where um, it will give more profits. It allows for exporters to sell their products in places where they will be pay more for them. And it allows importers to buy goods from where they can get them cheaper. So the single market with the four freedom of movement of goods, services, capital and workers is a market initiative that increases the efficiency of the European economy. In the next lecture, we saw some policies that are intended to improve the working of the single market. They are also policies that intend to uh, strengthen the single market or to um, correct the single market when it doesn't work perfectly. We saw in particular two very important policies. We saw first competition policy. And we saw how the EU fights against the creation of monopolies in Europe. And we saw how when the EU finds that they are monopolies, tries at least that they do not abuse their position of market dominance. This is a policy that tries to solve some cases of market failure or some cases of 
imperfect working of the market mechanism. We also saw last week the economic and monetary union, the euro, and how this policy tries to strengthen the single market too, because some of the barriers to trade are the exchange of different currencies in Europe. If you need to pay your workers in one currency, but you need to export your goods in a different currency, you will be subject to transaction costs for the exchange of currencies, and you will also be uh, subject to foreign exchange risk. If you are a consumer and you need to think where you buy your products from, when they are denominated in different currencies, it's also more difficult for you to compare the prices and to make the best possible decision. So the euro and economic and monetary union are policies that are intended to improve the single market too. But the kind of policies that we will <coughs> analyze today are different because they are policies that do not create a market or do not try to improve a market for efficiency reasons. In fact, many of those policies if you see them in isolation, from an economic point of view, they can be seen as inefficient policies. One very clear example is the common agricultural policy. The common agricultural policy in Europe has been criticized for being a very mm, inefficient policy, spending a lot, of the EU budget in subsidies for farmers or uh, sometimes creating imperfect competition in the agricultural markets or establishing quotas for the production of milk or certain products. So it's the common agricultural policy, it's not a market-oriented policy. <coughs> and there are many other policies like that. The regional policy, giving money to the poorest regions of Europe, is not a market-oriented policy. Or European social policy. When you give subsidies to people who work in a factory and now this factory has become uncompetitive because of competition from China and you give them subsidies to help them from the European Social Fund. It's not a market policy. So the kind of policies that we will see today are not policies that contribute directly to the creation of an efficient single market on, on the other way around it's mm, very often they are inefficient policies but they are still very important and here comes the title of the lecture today greasing the wheels these policies are very important to keep the European Union working. And these policies are very important in particular to maintain support for the European Union across the whole Union. Many of you come from a region that is lagging behind in Europe. It is an external border region of the EU 
and it is a region where the economy is not booming. It is a region where most of the young people emigrate to other places. It's a region where industry jobs have been reduced or have completely disappeared. It is a region where the economy does not look very good. But still, this region is very supportive of the European Union. And the kind of policies that we will see today are those kinds of policies that do not improve the European economy in general, but are very important to keep support for the single market in certain regions. <clears throat> so far, so good, Romulus. Where are you from, yeah. Romulus? Suchava. Suchava. How's the economy in Suchava? Uh, the economy is not so good as we want, mm -hmm. but uh, we want to improve that. Mm -hmm. And how about um, Gabriela Moroshan, Gabriela and Livia? Do you think that the single market has been good for Bukovina? Yes, I think it was good. Do you think that the um, industry has grown in Bukovina? Not that much that it should be, but yes, it's grown a little bit. What is it that Bukovina produces? Um, ice cream, Betty Ice. Yes. What else? Um, beer, beer. It have a company of uh, products uh, from uh, milk. Mm -hmm. But I understood that um, Dorna milk comes from Poland. Not um, from Bukovina. Yes. Telemea, La Dorna is made in Poland, not in Bukovina. Did you know that? Oh, yes, I know. That is the single market that allows that. Yes. You can read it on the news if you don't believe me. I believe La Dorna is not produced in Romania. It is produced in Poland. Can I mention something? Yes. Uh, the Pilos product, which is a, a, a Polish brand, is made in uh, Bukovina in the factory in Gurahumorul, for example. What is made in Gurahumorul? The, the cream. Mm -hmm. So, and then they finish it in Poland? Uh, no, they. Uh, they produce the cream here with a, a Pilos brand. Pilos is well known in, in a little. Um, um, yes, this this is not what I have read. You know, it's not what is is published about uh, La Dorna. It is. Uh, I read clearly that it is produced in Poland. The milk and everything is from Poland. And they said that only the recipe is Romanian. Only the way they make it, they try to imitate the Romanian style of making it. But the cows and the milk and everything is from Poland. Yes, because the Poland is the main uh, producer of the milk uh, in Europe. Yes. Yeah. It is um, good. <clears throat> so we go on. The idea is that <clears throat> uh, if it was not for the EU budget, many regions in Europe would be unhappy with the working of the single market because we said the single market is a market efficient policy. If this means that 
it's the most effective way to allocate resources and it means that the winners from this policy will win more than the losers will lose so in general overall we can say it's a good thing it's efficient but we also mentioned that there are winners and losers and that not everyone is equally happy with the results of the single market if you are a, an exporter and the single market will allow you to sell your products in other countries at a higher price that you sell them at home the single market is good for you but if you are a producer in a country that is importing from other european countries through the single market and you see that competition for you is increased and forces you to reduce your prices then the single market is not good if you are a worker in romania and you have the possibility to get a job in italy and be paid more than in romania the single market is good for you but if you are an italian and you want to work as a waiter and now you have the competition of romanians that are willing to work for less than you were working before then you are not so happy if you are the owner of the restaurant in italy that receives romanian workers and you can have now cheaper workers you are happy with the single market if you are the owner of a restaurant in romania and all your young people goes to italy and it is difficult for you to find workers and you have to increase your wages the single market is not as good for you so the single market is good overall it's a good thing but it has winners and losers and the european union has a budget and this budget allows in many cases to compensate the losers of the single market in order to maintain the people's support for the main policy of the eu for the single market so <clears throat> when um, the european economic community was created in 1957 it was a deal between germany and france and in this deal the germans knew that they would be able to export their industrial products to france and they would win from this and the french wanted something in exchange and they asked for the creation of the common agricultural policy and they asked for a policy that would support farmers and it was the deal and it's like a package deal and it's like a compensation right you see now that we are living in the moments of brexit but in 1965 there was also a very serious crisis in the european economic community it was called the empty chair crisis when de gaulle was president in france at that time brexit was not possible the treaties did not allow for exiting the eu but what de gaulle did is that he withdrew the ministers and the ambassadors from the EU, they did not participate in the voting. So he left the EU temporarily, de facto. It was called the empty chair crisis. Right? And one of the things that he asked as a guarantee 
in order to continue in the European Economic Community was to guarantee that the European Community would continue paying for farmers and that the European Union would have its own budget that would have sufficient financial independence to have money to pay the French farmers. This is um, the time when the European Union created its own resources. What does it mean, own resources? It means that before, at the very beginning, the European community depended on, on the contributions from member states alone. Each member state had to contribute every year an amount of money for the functioning of the community. But it was in the 60s <clears throat> when they created this system of own resources, <coughs> which means that the EU would have its own money. And where does this money come from, its own, own resources? It comes from the taxes, the import taxes it collects at the external borders. These are now the traditional own resources of the EU. And the EU budget has grown with time and other resources have been created. For instance, the VAT, you know now the VAT, TVA in Romania. The VAT is a tax in every country of the EU and one proportion of that tax goes to the EU budget. This is also one of the resources it has now. And there is now the most important resource now is a contribution based on the economic power of each member state. With all those resources, still, the budget of the European Union is very small. The budget of the EU represents little more than 1% of the European Union's GDP. Little more than 1%. And national budgets, on average, in Europe, represent more than 40% of the national production. So this means that the EU budget is very, very small compared to the budget of national governments, for instance. Did you know that, Romulus? Do you hear me? Yes. Did, did you know that the budget is so small? No, I don't know. That's only 100, 100% of uh, 1 GDP of Europe. Only of the production of Europe goes to the EU budget. 1% can be a lot, but if you compare it with 40% or 50% in some countries, that's very little, right? Yes. How about you, Gabriela and Livia? Did you know that, that the EU budget was small? No, no, we didn't know what it was the little, problem. Little more than 1%. And it is kept uh, small also intentionally. You know that in some countries, the governments have deficits. Yes. They spend more than they have in the budget. In, in, in the EU, it's forbidden to have a deficit. The EU cannot make a budget in which there will be more spending than income. It is forbidden by the treaties. 
right? Also in the EU, uh, it cannot indebt themselves. They cannot have public debt of the European Union. It's not like national governments. And also the budget where you cannot have deficit, the amount of own resources of the EU, the income of the EU is limited by the treaties. So they agree every seven years to limit this to little more than 1% of the European production. So it is small and it cannot grow because the member states do not allow it to grow. Right? Good. <clears throat> the budget is small and this contrasts with the perception in some countries such as Romania, when they join the EU, they think, well, maybe the EU is not as good for my business or for the economy in my region, but we will receive European funds. And they think that European funds are very important. And if you look statistically, the budget <coughs> is so small right but <clears throat> the fact that the budget is small doesn't mean that it is not important and it cannot um, fulfill its mission we said that the budget helps compensating the losers of european integration and it helps uh, gathering public support for the EU, like in Romania. They are happy with the EU because they receive European funds. Right? Why? As such a small budget can work so well. <clears throat> well, this is because the EU budget can be concentrated. So, the EU budget is small for the EU as a whole, but for instance, regional policy concentrates funds on the regions that are lagging behind. So, whereas the budget represents 1% of the European economy, for some national economies of poor countries, European funds can represent 3% or 5% if they are concentrated, right? But even more, not only the funds are concentrated in different countries. The funds, they are concentrated on specific people within those countries. So, if you are a minister in Romania, the EU funds for you will not represent 1% of your wage or 3% of your wage or 5% of your wage. Maybe you receive more from the EU than from your national government. And this has to do with something that is often criticized in Romania. Many people say, we receive so many millions of euros in, in European funds and our politicians do not build highways. I hear that very often. The politicians keep the money for themselves and they do not build the highways for everyone. It's a common criticism, isn't it, Gabriela? <coughs> yes. 
Have you heard that before, right? Yes. Many people say that. They complain. We receive so many millions and we do not see what they do with this money. Yes, a lot of people complain. But because we have also some person who works in the uh, public sector and he can know, Claude, you can know better how it works, how some people in the public sector, important people, and they receive like a second wage from the EU that is bigger than the main wage that they have. They say that we manage European projects, European funds. And they receive a second wage for that, that for them is really important because it represents more than the main wage that they have. It does not represent 1%, 3 5%. It maybe represents 300% of their normal wage, right? So what happens with funds is that Although the total amount is small, it can be concentrated, not only concentrated in countries, but concentrated in particular people. And when it is a country, <clears throat> a very democratic country, right? The leaders of that country, they need the support of the a great amount of people to stay in power. In such a country, when they receive European funds, <coughs> they build highways. They make public goods for people to be happy and to keep their support and to be re-elected. There are other countries where the political system is not so democratic and where the leaders of the country, they do not need the support of a majority of the population to stay in power. They just need the support of a few people, of a few groups of friends. In that kind of country, when they receive European funds, they can use it for increasing their own wages or the wages of their friends or the wages of important business people in the region or the wages of the oligarchs, right? And that is <clears throat> what explains why the funds when they are giving in one country, they go to highways. When they are giving in other country, they do not go to highways. They go to wages for the project manager of the project, or they go to commissions for the um, car dealer that sells electric cars for the city of Suchava. Because you knew that in Suchava you have electric cars, Romulus. Yes, we have. What do you it's think? A about that? It's a very modern the city, world the city. Yes, it's very modern, but only when only. They told me that the person who was managing this, and I told him, but what is the benefit of this for Suchava? <clears throat> you know what he said? No. He said that the benefit was that he bought the electric cars from a local car dealer. And that was the benefit for Suchava of having electric cars. The EU budget allows this. The EU budget wants the European Union to work. And the European Union has to work in all the countries. 
And if in Romania your system is not very democratic, and if your leaders they just want the money for themselves, the European Union, there's not much they can do about that. They just give the money to those who can make the European Union work. If in your country, those who make the European Union work are your president of Concilio Judeziano or are your um, leaders, ministers or whatever, they give the money to them. And they get support for the EU. And when they vote something in Brussels, Romania says yes. Right? Good. <clears throat> Many policies are like that, you know, it's the, the regional policy. You mentioned that uh, <coughs> very often they do not build highways with the money right sometimes they just uh, build an airport that they already had one and they build a new one and they buy the land from their friends uh, to make a new airport when they already had one before and it's just a way to receive those funds in many places you will see that right With farmers, it's something similar. They want public support for the EU. And mostly in the beginning, farmers were very important because the European economy has evolved. And in the past, the farming sector was much more important than now. There were many votes in the farming sector. So in the beginning, Almost all the money of the EU went for farmers in the 70s. In the early 80s, 70% of the money went for farmers. Not anymore, because the farming sector is being reduced, and now they are increasing the amounts of money they give for regional policy, for instance for the northeast region of Romania. <clears throat> but how about the young people? How about Gabriela Moroshan, Livia Mihalaki? They support the EU. Don't you support the EU? Yes. So the EU doesn't give you jobs in Suchava. The EU doesn't give you highways or, or funds. But you, the young people in Romania that are very important still support the EU. And here it comes a very important policy of the EU, European social policy. And European social policy is based mostly on one idea that was created at the time when the Maastricht treaty was approved when the euro was created they created also this idea of european citizenship this idea that people they say we want to be in the eu we do not have many jobs here we do not have good highways we do, but we are european citizens which means that we will be able to emigrate to any country and not only emigrate to work in that country. 
we, if we want, we can go to the UK and study in a UK university and receive a scholarship not to pay, receive a, like a government uh, funded uh, loan so that we do not have to pay. And this loan probably we will never have to repay because you only have to repay it when your wage exceeds 30,000 euros per month or a very large amount that you do not foresee to uh, reach in Romania. So you can go to the UK, to university, and instead of paying 11,000 euros per year in fees, the government pays that for you. Or if you go to other country and you can receive scholarships for that country, the same as the local uh, students, and you can also have medical health care, the same as the local people, and you have a whole series of benefits because you are a European citizen. This idea of European citizenship has been created in the time of the Maastricht Treaty because at that time there was the first Eurosceptic movements in Europe. This treaty had to be approved by referendum in Denmark. It was rejected by the people. Then it was submitted again and it was approved. In France, it was approved, but by a very small margin. They needed the support of the people and they created this idea of European citizenship. That was something that existed before. So when we discuss this kind of social policies in Europe, you should understand a very important thing, which is that the EU budget is small, only 1% of the European national product. Small. But European social policy does not only use the EU budget, it also uses the national budgets. Because when they tell you that you are a European citizen, <coughs> if you go to Italy, if you go to Spain, to Germany, to the UK, to France, to work or to look for work or to ask for money on the street, or to do whatever you do there, you will be entitled to have the same rights as a European citizen and receive benefits <coughs> and <coughs> benefit from the social welfare system in that country. And this is something very important. And this is something very important for your region, Romulus. Because in your region, with no jobs, Romulus. Yes. Absolutely no jobs. There would be a revolution. This would be like uh, the tribes in Africa killing themselves with such an economy as you have now in Suchava. The young people would start killing people there. But they don't do it. And they don't do it not because of the European Union funds, that they are kept by local politicians. They don't kill anyone because they get the possibility to emigrate in other places. Yes. So everyone is happy. 
right? So these policies that we see today <clears throat> are not market policies, but are very important for the market policies of the EU to work. And they cost only 1% of the national product of the EU and a little bit more because many of those policies, they do not only spend from EU money, they sometimes force national governments budget. to pay for the health care of Romanians or to pay for the scholarships of Romanians. Yes, it was a scandal now in Austria. I think they want to ban uh, Romanian children from allocation. They want to pay all uh, the amount of Romania allocation, not from Austria. In, with the, the UK, <coughs> this was important in the referendum. In the UK, there were many Polish workers. And these workers, many of them had children. And they received this allowance for children, child allowance. Yes. But their children were in Poland. Same they, as now in Romania. They worked in the UK, they had the children in Poland, but the UK government had to pay the child allowance for them. And the European Union social policy forced the UK to pay the child allowance to these people. Why? Because it's important to keep the EU together, to keep it working. It's important for uh, young people that are born in, in Suchava with no jobs. It's important for them not to revolt against the European Union. Right? Yes. Good. <clears throat> Gabriela. Yes. You personally did not emigrate or Libya. You may think about emigrating in the future. <clears throat> but still, even if you don't emigrate, you benefit from the fact that other young people emigrate. So there's less competition with you for jobs in Suchava. Yes. Claud, you does not agree. You can participate. Yes, yes you are, I'm agree that uh, is more opportunity for the young people now uh, than in the past, but uh, we cannot compete with a uh, with a uh, salary in uh, in UK, for example. There is no uh, almost no company who can pay two thousand pounds for a uh, for a worker in Romania. Mm -hmm. So this is quite a this is a quite a. You know what happens, Claudio is that m many of the people that go to the UK, they do not have a 2,000 pound wage. Sometimes they go there and they are just waiters and they just work for a few hours per day and they just receive the minimum wage and it's not that much. But still, it is good enough because it's not only the wage. When they made, um, when it was the Brexit uh, referendum, they made interviews with people, with workers there. And they asked workers from Romania, from uh, Poland, why they moved to the UK, yes? And I remember a woman there that worked in a factory and she said, 
I decided to come to the UK <coughs> not because of the wage. Because the wage I will receive here is not that much, and I also have to pay the expenses here. The, the, um, the bills are more expensive, the, the apartment and so on. But what made me decide to come here was the fact that my children would be able to go to a good English school and they would be able to know English from a very young age. And then in the future, that is something valuable. So she said, it's not because of the wage, it's because of the education of my children. I know many cases uh, when the Romanian uh, worker comes back uh, exactly for the, the same uh, thing. They try to educate their children in Romania because in uh, Italy, for example, they, they, they have a lot of problems with the, uh, and they, uh, they, uh, they return for the, uh, for the children here. And this is they, what, the, what the European Union gives you, this ability to choose yeah. places. And some people choose the UK, some people choose Italy, some people choose France. I think that uh, we all are uh, agree that uh, 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 European single market uh, gives the opportunity to have uh, uh, to have more possibility in uh, in our jobs. Uh, this mobility of the jobs is quite excellent. Uh, for the young people, especially, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, I think, what a very essential point in order to keep their support for the EU. Because what I noticed also, uh, the UK was a very important destination for people. Also, people in Suchava, they had like uh, flights from Suchava to the UK. And uh, what, I, what I noticed is that after the referendum for Brexit, public support for the EU in the Northeast region of Romania has declined. So I noticed, you know, the Eurobarometer survey it's a survey that measures public opinion in Europe. And some of the questions are about how much people support the EU. And after the Brexit referendum, support for the EU declined in the northeast of Romania. And one reason could be that, that the, this region is not a booming region. It, the economy of the region is not very good, but at least in exchange, you have the possibility to emigrate in other better places. With Brexit, you lose the possibility to emigrate in the UK. So what the European Union offers you declines. So <laughs> it's interesting because uh, it's connected. Yeah. Yes, I, I mean the, the the decline in support for the EU was very dramatic in 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 the northeast. And you say why well, the northeast always was so favorable to the EU and suddenly it became Eurosceptic. A majority of people they said that they their country did not benefit from the EU, that the EU was a bad thing. Maybe because the, a lot of uh, uh, people from uh, the northeastern region of Romania uh, has a job in the UK, maybe, or maybe because 
what happened in the UK also makes them afraid of what will happen in Europe as a whole. You mentioned now the case of Austria, you said, <coughs> or Romulus said that, that they wanted to withdraw the child allowance benefits for Romanians. And they see that if in Europe this unity is declining and there's no longer support for social policy in Europe, maybe they think we have corrupt politicians, we have no industry, what is our benefit in being members of the EU if we cannot emigrate to other EU countries? It's an interesting question, but it's for you to, to know. It's just a hypothesis what I mentioned, right? It may be some other reason. Romulus. So, to summarize, the EU budget is small, but it can be still important if it is concentrated. It can be concentrated in different countries or regions, or even concentrated in important people within one country. And this helps gathering public support for the EU. So the EU budget in regions such as your region, many people mention it as a good thing of the EU. And sometimes there are teachers <coughs> that they see that the economy doesn't go well, that they do not have many students, that they sh probably should be unhappy with the current situation. But they are still happy because they have a European project and they receive money from the EU. Right? Good. But the budget is not the only way how the European Union spends. Because the European Union has the power to approve legislation that forces national governments to spend. Yes? So if the EU does not have health care system, European health care system, but the European Union can pass a law that says European citizens should be able to access the health care system of any countries of the EU. It's the same effect. Do you know how many people from Romania and Bulgaria arrived in the UK in 2016? The population of Bul Bulgarian and Romanian people in the UK, how much did it increase in 2016? How much do you think? Increased by how much? 100 people, 1,000, 10,000, 1 million. So you are about the people in UK or in this country? In UK, the people in UK that arrived. I, I think the population increased, but I don't know how, how many people. 71,000. In 70, one year, they increase. How much is the population in Suchawa? Around uh, 100,000. Almost like the whole city of Suchawa? Go to UK. Go to UK in one year. We will make a Suchawa in the UK. Yes. <laughs> and, and one in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Good. 
Any questions or comments that you may have? If you don't have questions or comments, I thank you very much for your participation and see you this evening in the seminar. At six. Until then, uh, I remind you that next week we will also have the lecture on Friday, not on Monday, on Friday in one week. So until the next week, thanks again and bye-bye. Bye-bye.